Hello, church family. My name is Michael Gentry, and this is The Recap. As you know, the Ebenezer Church is moving forward, committed to grow in 2024. And our focus for the months of May and June will be family. We started off with our faith, favor, fortitude, finances. And now God wants to challenge this local branch of Zion as to what it really means to be family. Family, biologically, and family through what we call the church, the body of Christ. Because your neighbor said, we are family. Look at some man and tell him, you are my cousin. And you are either my brother or my sister in Christ if both of us profess Jesus Christ. Pastor Covington started this series this past Sunday by focusing on the writings of the Apostle John. At the 8 o'clock service, he preached from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. And then at the 1045 service, he preached from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 12. Now, before Pastor Covington began these two powerful messages, he explained that he was drawing inspiration for this series from a book by journalist and television host Joy Reid entitled Medgar and Murley, The Love Story That Awakened a Nation. I'm reading a very touching book. It's not a Christian book per se, but it is about a Christian family. Against the backdrop and context of civil rights movement and murder and a widow bringing up three children called Mega and Merle. It is an excellent read. Again, both Mega and Merle are Christian. Mega, as you know, was murdered in his driveway at the age of 39. Dr. King got killed in his 30s, around 39. Malcolm, 39. But this is an excellent, excellent read about a family, a family, both proclaiming Christianity as their faith tradition. A wife with three young children being raised in a racist society in Mississippi. Amen. So between now and June, I may be referring to some things in the book as we relate to what it means to be family, because we need to see the model of family. Before getting into the text, Pastor Covington made an interesting statement. He said that the logical place to start a message on family would be Genesis 1 and 2, where God created mankind, male and female, in his image on the sixth day, forming Adam from the dust, forming Eve from Adam's rib, and commanding them to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and have dominion over it. That is the origin of the family. But as we know, sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3, and from that day till now, sin has caused this function in the family that God created. Thus, Pastor Covington chose to begin this series not on the origin of the family, but the essence of it. What it is that makes a family exist as God intended. John does just that. He tells the rest of us about a great God with a great love for great sinners. 
is that great love that I want to start this series on family off with. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if we settle uh, 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 the family issue, if we can get that right, it may start a domino effect where we can get other relationships right. The family that God intended is built upon feelings, actions, and values. Feelings, the tenderness and passion and desire that we have for one another. Actions, that is the loyalty, commitment, sticking together, standing for each other, lifting each other up. And values, our shared beliefs and the code of conduct that determine how we treat each other and what we should expect from one another. All of this boils down to one term, love. The problem, however, which Pastor Covington pointed out, is that love is not always present in the relationships that God intended for it to exist within. The family all too often exists without the love that makes it family, and the consequences are dire. What is missing today is we got a lot of folk living in a lot of households, but I wonder how many families do we have? Children are directing parents at younger and younger ages. Parents are acquiescing, becoming rather seldom to be the friend of the child than the parent of the child. Fatherlessness is a part seemingly of what is expected now. On both ends. We're living in an interesting day. In preparation for the message, I looked on my phone and I saw this. Alamance County deputies charged man with child sex crimes believed that he abused a minor for three years in between the ages of nine and twelve. Wells Fargo robbed in Winston-Salem suspect and getaway driver found at BP station, officials say. North Carolina family mourns loved one killed in one of two back-to-back Winston-Salem stabbings. Parkland student who was filmed slapping teacher will be tried as an adult, facing several charges. We're preaching on family. Obviously, you know, I can go on and on and on. Families, as I said on this past Wednesday night, are in a free fall of disintegration. If the family goes, so goes the church, so goes the community, so goes the country. And what I want to do for these next few Sundays that the Lord will give me, God spares life, Let's talk about family and challenge us. Keep in mind, if you live long, you'll grow old. But will you ever grow up? And how we handle one another and how we treat one another. The reasons that families become dysfunctional, lose the love, is because God in some way has been pushed out of the relationship. Our text in 1 John tells us love comes from God. In fact, everyone who has true love is of God because God is love. If God is not allowed to dwell within the relationship, then the love won't be there. The feelings might be there, but the actions and the values of love won't be. And eventually the feelings leave too which is why we are a nation with a 50% divorce rate. A large portion of the people in our society who claim to love each other at least to the point of being legally bound, at some point decide they're not feeling it anymore. And of course, we are in a time where biological relationships are being created by people who don't even want to be legally bound with each other. 
don't even want to create a family, just wanted to participate in the precipitating act, thus bringing about biological connections that exist without love. Without God, without committing to God's way, the love that ought to be found in the relationship won't be there. So now for us who claim to be committed to God's way, how can we keep the love in our biological and spiritual families? Well, first, by remembering where it comes from. Behind everything is love because what? God is love and love is of God. God will never move unless a love, it's a love move. Come on, somebody. Even when you get out of line and God has to put you back in place, he says he chastises those that he loves. So I believe behind every story in the Bible in life stands the unshakable, unbreakable love of God. Love, love is the basic foundational ingredient for the family. Without it, we have chaos. Violence, abuse, neglect, manipulation, narcissism, war, and even death. But with God's love, we can live in peace with ourselves, with God, and with other people. There in verses 7 through 11, we'll walk through it. Can I, can I tell you this? Three or four things. Number one, God's love is unspeakable. Somebody holler, it's unspeakable. In other, words, in other words, in other words, you and I who are finite, who are limited, we cannot comprehend the length, the breadth, the depth, or the height of God's love. Listen, God's love is even hard to explain. I can't explain it, but I can exclaim it because I have experienced it. Oh, it's, 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 a, it's also unending. God is eternal. Say that with me. What? Jeremiah 31 3 talks about the prophet saying, God, God is God, God, God is saying, God is saying, God, God says, I'm loving you with an everlasting love. Wow. It's not a turn on, turn off kind of thing. It's everlasting. Friend, when you at your worst, God loves you. When you at your best, God loves you. When people love you, God loves you. When nobody cares about you, God loves you. God's love is as old as God, and God is from everlasting to everlasting. There's never been a time that God was not. There will never be a time that God will cease to be. God will always be God. That means you will always be loved by God. It's unending. It's unselfish. God's love is a sending, searching, seeking, sealing kind of love. That's sacrificial. And the thing about God's love is it acts nothing in return. Oh, God. It's a leading, feeding, seeding kind of love. And if we respond to it rightfully through repentance, it's a heeding kind of love. God's love is unselfish. Over half of the stuff that's going on in our world is done through our selfishness. His love is unmerited. It cannot be earned. It cannot be worked for. It, but, but God's love is based on God's grace. And can I tell you this? It's unconditional. <laughs> it's not that tick for tack kind of stuff. Are y'all hearing me? It, 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 it's, it's not transactional. It's transformational. Uh, 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 it's not you scratch my back. I'll scratch your back kind of stuff because God's back never itches because God does not have a back. 
is unconditional. And here is the shout. Here it is. God loved us first. God loves us anyway. And God loves us eternally. And remembering where it comes from, our two texts ask us then to model ourselves after the one from whom love flows. In John 15, 12, Jesus tells his disciples and thus the church, my command is that you love each other as I have loved you. And in verse 13, he further explains what he means saying, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The willingness to sacrifice ourselves for others is the type of love that Jesus is commanding that we have in our relationships. And John, who was there with the rest of the disciples when Jesus said it, and there at the cross of Calvary when Jesus showed it, reaffirmed it to the church in his letter in 1 John 4, 9 and 10. And this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God poured all his wrath on his son who had done nothing to earn the wrath of God. But God saw Larry Covington. God saw Caroline Covington. God saw Desiree. God saw you. God saw me. And God said, God, God said, I got to pour my wrath on sin. And Jesus stepped in and said, I'll be the sin bearer. Somebody ought to be glad today. God's love was never designed just to be declared. It had to be demonstrated. I don't get to choose how I'm going to love you. I am to love you the way Jesus loves me. And when I'm tempted to give you a hard time, I think, wait a minute, did Jesus give me a hard time? What kind of love? It's Jesus commanding us to have. It's the laying down kind of love. If you love me, what are you willing to lay down so that I can sense your love? Jesus went to the extreme, the extravagance. Greater love than no man have, as I've shared with you, than one that's willing to lay down his life. Now, a woman who has a modicum of sense would not, would not mind marrying a man that she knows is willing to lay down his life for her. And vice versa. What are you willing to lay down so that the other person can be ministered to? How far does your love go? Some people's love don't go around the corner, don't even get out the house. And we wonder why our families are all jacked up and messed up because nobody is laying down their life for the other person. Now, I'm not talking about physical death, because, but that is the extreme that Jesus went to because Jesus actually died for us. But So we can put that away over here as an extreme. But I'm talking about just go out and check the mail in the rain. It's a laying down kind of love. But can I give you something else? It's a lifting up kind of love. Who are you lifting? Whose life is better because you are alive? That's all for me. I need to go put love into action by cleaning up this house before my wife gets home. But we'll meet again next time on The Recap. <laughs>